Well, good morning to you all. Thanks for being here on this bright, sunny day outside. Uh, let's sing two or three verses of this song uh, together before we have our announcements. Rick brings those to us. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, and him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and tempt me so, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. If by faith and do his blessed will, a wall of fire above me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manner me, my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Not so sure about that bright and sunshiny day that Rick was talking about, but it's bright and sunshiny in here. It's good to see everyone this morning. We certainly welcome you here. We're glad you could be here. We're glad you feel like being here. If you're visiting with us, we certainly want to invite you back at each and every opportunity that you might have. I don't have a whole lot this morning, but uh, some things I want to remind you of. Uh, Glenda Dieter, uh, I guess it's still an NEA. She had two stints put in uh, this week, and I understand she's doing well, but is she still in the hospital? Does anybody know? She is still in the hospital, so remember Glenda in your prayers. Marlena Goodman is, is dealing with an infection in her foot. I know she would appreciate our prayers. Uh, Norma Johnson, this is Donna's, Donna McDowell's mom, is having some chronic issues, chronic UTI issues, and, and I know that uh, Ms. Johnson and, and Donna would appreciate us praying about that as well. So remember them in your prayers. Uh, Meals on Wheels is coming up November the 21st. Uh, Bradley is, is kind of coordinating that effort, and he's trying to determine uh, how much interest there is with, with all this going on. So if you're interested in receiving a meal or being involved in that, contact, uh, you can contact Bradley Dunlap or call Miss Donna at the office and let them know about that so we'll know what direction to go in there. Uh, Dorcas workers are still needed. Is that right, Frank? Uh, anyone who can help from 8 to 10 on Tuesdays. I know Frank would appreciate it and those others that are working. Remember your, your change cans for, for the children's home. Those are due by the end of the month. And I suppose you can bring them and lay them, uh, put them on the uh, desk back there or, or leave them in the office. That's all that I have. Anybody else have anything that I need to announce anything that I overlook? Let's start our worship with a prayer again. Bow with me, please. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love for us. We're thankful for your presence here this morning and the fact that, that you're involved in our lives. We're thankful for your, for your Holy Spirit that you sent to dwell in us and help us through difficult times like the ones we're experiencing right now. We're thankful for your son. 
for the life that he lived and, and certainly for the death that he died and the grace that he provided and the fact that we can know that he's gone to prepare a place for us. We're mindful of those that are sick, the father that was mentioned this morning, Miss Glenda and Marlena and Miss Johnson and others. We just pray that you would uh, be involved in those situations. You know the needs. We ask that you would be with those caregivers, with those doctors and nurses, and, and all those that are involved in that, Father. And because we know how much you love us, we, we trust your judgment, and we just turn those things over to you. You've told us that we can cast our cares on you, and, and that's what we're doing. We, we pray for healing for all of those folks, and for all of those in our number, and, and those that we know that are dealing with this virus. We just pray that you would help us to uh, not only to deal with the circumstances that we find ourselves in, but be with those that are working to find an end to this and that we can defeat it and that we can get back to uh, back to what, what we consider to be normal, that our worship will become, uh, our family will become more whole as a result of that. We pray for this family, Father. We, we worry about it under these circumstances. And we pray for Britt and for Jeff. And we just ask that you would give them... Uh, wisdom and courage as they try to, to lead us and, and deal with this situation. Help them, help them to know what to do, Father. Just be involved in that. We just want to pray, Father, for, for our worship this morning. Pray that those things that we do and say are in accordance with your will. Be with Jay as he brings our lesson and with Britt as he leads our singing and help us to be mindful of the thought, songs that we're singing, Father, and to know that this is our praise. And we're offering this up as a, a, a pleasant fragrance for you, Father. And we just pray that it's acceptable. As we become involved and, and be a part of this communion service, Father, again, we pray that you will help us to, to remember the things that were done for us, that, that your son died for us, that his blood was shed, that, that we can know that we're going to, uh, that we have a place prepared for us. Just help us to be uh, focused as we participate in this in this memorial service. Bless us, Father, in, in our daily activities and help us to conduct ourselves so that others can see Christ living in us and they can know that we are peculiar people and that we can live up to those standards that you set for us. Forgive us when we fall short, Father, and help us to, to always walk in the light, Father, and to keep you first in our lives. In Jesus' name. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Green grass and flowers all blooming in springtime are works of the Master. I live for each day. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the beauty that surrounds me. Aware of the one who made it all, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. There's a story of some Civil War soldiers who were meeting together after the Civil War was uh, completed several years later. Veterans. And there were uh, Confederates and Union soldiers in the group, and one was telling a story about one night being uh, uh, on the front lines, and he was a sentry in, in 
And as he circled, the sentry from the opposing side, uh, they came face to face. And uh, one got the drop on the other, and he, he drew down on him. And uh, the other gentleman, who was uh, on the bad end of the stick, started singing, Jesus, lover of my soul. Started singing the words, and, and uh, the opposing soldier was unable to, uh, to shoot him. They, they, they parted company. And uh, as the man was telling this story, the guy said, was that the Battle of Atlanta in 64? Because I was that guy. Um, people have been taking comfort and inspiration uh, and using these words for worship for a long time. This, this was published in 1738-ish. Uh, and uh, the, the power of, for us, even with masks on, to be singing these words together and singing these parts and uh, offering this as worship to God uh, is very powerful today. I'm glad to be doing this with you guys. Uh, we're going to sing this one and we'll sing one more uh, before we uh, uh, consider some thoughts centered around the emblem. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the near waters roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O oh my Savior, hide till the storm of life is past, safe into the haven guide, oh, receive my soul at last. Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave, oh, leave me not alone, till support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stayed. All my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of Plenteous grace for me is found, grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, make and keep me pure within. Thou of life the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart to all eternity. <laughs> I hear the Savior say thy strength Indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me my all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Lord, now indeed I find thy power, and thine alone can change the leper's spot and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin Crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, and 
when before the throne I stand in him complete, I'll lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus' feet. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin Stain. He washed it white as snow. There was a a uh, record breaking swimmer. Um, back in the 1950s, and uh, not record-breaking in the sense that we normally think of, you know, Olympic Games and medals and all that. Um, her specialty was more long-distance swimming and breaking those kind of records, and her name was Florence Chadwick, um, and she did multiple different swims like this. Um, the first one she did that really gained notoriety was she swam the English Channel. She actually did this twice. She did it first in 1950. She went from France to England. And then in 51, she turned around again and went from England to France. And this is about a 21-mile swim, um, from what I could see. So on July 4th, 1952, um, she decides to try to do another one of these swims. Um, this time it's swimming from Catalina Island, which is off the coast of California, to the coast, which again is about 21 miles, so the same distance, something that she had done before. But on the day she decides to do this, um, it's reported that the fog was so thick that she couldn't even see the boat that would accompany them while they swam in case anything happened or they needed to, to stop. Um, that's how thick it was. She couldn't see the boat that was, you know, say 20 feet away from her maybe. But she decides to go ahead and try this swim this day anyways. Um, gets in the water, swims for 15 hours and 55 minutes. Gave everything she had, everything she thought she had. Um, but still just nothing but fog. So she stops, she taps out, gets in the boat, um, and she just has to give up. When she gets to the coast, the boat takes her the rest of the way in. They let her know that she stopped a half mile short from the coast. She sent 20 and a half miles, um, but she could not finish that last half mile. And the reporter was interviewing after this, um, like they do, asking them, hey, what went wrong? What were you thinking? And she didn't make any excuses. Uh, this was her quote. She said, look, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen land, I know I could have made it. So I guess my question as we sit around the table today and my question for myself and for you is, what fog are you guys bringing in here with you this morning to worship? Because we're all, I mean, we're all bringing bringing something in here with us. Um, very real stuff, especially right now, um, whether it's relationship issues, um, could be a job or lack thereof, um, financial struggles, health concerns, health fears, especially with all this going on right now. So what fog are you bringing in? And then the second part of that would be, is that keeping us from seeing the shoreline? Which for us would be eternity with our God and with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we bring that fog in here with us this morning, though, we get to meet weekly, and we get to bring that with us, but we get to lay that at the foot of the cross. And we get to have this time to readjust our sights on the shoreline. And we're only, only able to do that. And this shoreline for us is only attainable because of what Jesus was willing to do for us and go into the cross for us. Hebrews 12, 2 encourages it this way. It tells us to let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we take these emblems this morning and, and, and have these thoughts, let's go to God and pray. God, we are so grateful to to be here this morning, to, to have this time to, 
to sing songs and, and to hear from your word, but to, to have this time specifically to just stop and to take time to remember what was done for us, God. As we get to take this bread and this cup, which represents Jesus' body and his blood, God, we get to take these things and, and just meditate on what he was willing to do for us. And we get to refocus our lives around you and around that because of this event. Be with us as we do this right now, God. Let us do it in a worthy and pleasing manner to you. In Jesus' name. Again, God, we want to thank you for this time to, to bring our concerns to you again and to, to lay those at the foot of the cross like you allow us to do, God, and to be able to stand in such immeasurable grace that we don't deserve, God, and there's nothing that we could do to deserve it. But you've freely given it to us, God. You sent your son to die. Um, and he was willing to do that for us, God, so that we may be saved. We can have a relationship with you because of what he did for us. And we thank you for the way that this blood cleanses us and the way it makes us look in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Jesus rose of Sharon, bloom within my heart. Beauties of thy truth and holiness impart. That where'er I go, my life may shed abroad. Fragrance of the knowledge of the love of God, Jesus, Rose of Sharon, bloom in radiance and in love within my heart, Jesus, Rose of Sharon, sweet and far to see. Than the fairest flowers of earth could ever be. Fill my life completely and more each day. Of my grace, divine and pure as he, I pray. Jesus. Sharon, bloom in radiance and in love. 
love within my heart. Jesus, Rose of Sharon, bloom forevermore. Be glory received on earth from shore to shore, till the nations own thy sovereignty complete. Lay their honors down in worship at thy feet. Jesus, Rose of Sharon, Father, hear the prayer we offer, nor for ease that prayer shall be, but for strength that we may ever live our lives courageously. Not forever by still water, would we idly quiet stay, but with smite the living fountains from the rocks along our way. Be our strength in hours of weakness, in our wanderings be our God. Through endeavor, failure, danger, Father, be thou on our side. Let our path be bright or dreary, storm or sunshine be our share. May our souls in hope unweary. Make thy work our ceaseless prayer. Let's stand together. It's convenient for you, please. Stand for this song and for the scripture reading after. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. It is safely moored, will the storm withstand, for it is well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables pass from his heart, mind can defy the blast through strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night the city of gold, harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore when the storms all pass forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul Stand fast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's
scripture reading will be from Ephesians 3, 14 through 17. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. You may be seated. You may be seated. Good morning. I hope that you are uh, as glad to be here today as I am. You know, it's it's really hard for me to look out and uh, see all your faces and, and not smile at least a little bit. I'm always so happy to see you. You know, there are a lot of people who think going to church is just normal, routine, standard. It's just something that you do on Sunday. But it's so much more than that, isn't it? Being together and worshiping God, this is a very significant moment. And I hope that we're realizing that a little bit more. And I certainly hope that we're more thankful, more appreciative of that. Uh, we're in Ephesians chapter 3. We continue to march on through the book. I've enjoyed this study so far. I pray that you enjoy it too. Uh, we're going to be in verses 14 through 21 here in just a few moments. There was a, a famous oil field called Yates Pool. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. I, I hadn't before I started writing the sermon. But during the Great Depression, this field was uh, actually nothing more than a sheep ranch owned by a man whose last name was, as you could probably guess, Yates. Well, he wasn't able to make enough in his ranching operation uh, to pay the interest on his mortgage, so he was in danger of losing the entire ranch. With uh, little money for clothes, food, uh, anything else for his family. Uh, they, like many others during the time, they had to live on government help. They had to rely on the government to help them get through. So day after day, as he grazed his sheep over these hills in West Texas, no doubt he was, he was troubled, wondering how he was going to pay his bills, how he was going to make ends meet. But then one day, an oil company came into the area and told him that there was a chance there might be some oil underneath his land. So they asked permission to drill a well. And he pretty quickly signed the contract. Well, they began work, and at 1,115 feet, they struck this huge oil reserve. The very first well they dug came in at 80,000 barrels a day. Other wells would go on to give over twice that much. In fact, 30 years later, 30 years later, a government test of one of these wells showed that it still had the potential flow of 100 and 25,000 barrels of oil a day. Can you imagine that? How much money was all that worth? And Mr. Yates owned every bit of it. Because the day he purchased the land, he received all the oil and mineral rights for the land. And yet for so long he had been living with government relief. I mean, a guy who was going to be a multimillionaire living in poverty for so long. And the reason for that, the, the problem was, he didn't know the oil was there, even though it was already his. You know, how many times lately have we said in sermons, in uh, talks before communion, in prayers, that this has been a strange and difficult year? How many times have you heard that lately? Oh, 2020, an unprecedented time. It is a strange year. It's unlike anything we ever, we've ever heard. How many times have you heard that? A lot, right? And there's a reason for that. It's because it's all true. Every bit of it, this is a strange and difficult year. This year has been a doozy. There's no question about it. And hopefully we are headed toward the end of it. It's in October. It still seems like there's at least 15 months left in 2020. But we're still feeling the effects of it, aren't we? And here we are in October, still wearing these silly little masks over our faces in church. I think people are tired People are worn down. People are weary. Maybe some people feel helpless. Like there's nothing they can do to solve these issues. Like there just doesn't ever seem to be an end to it. It's one thing after another. Some people feel helpless. So the question is, 
Are we? Are we helpless? My answer to that question is an unequivocal no. We are not helpless. Absolutely not. Of all the people in this world, we are the last people to be helpless. Because we are children of the Almighty God. And I think Paul agrees with that statement in our text today. We are going to read chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. But before we jump into that, let's pray together as a church. Heavenly Father, God, we are so blessed to be together today and to worship you. We ask that you would guide us in that effort today. And as we study from your word, God, certainly guide us there as well. Speak to us today and help us to listen. God, we want to look more like you and more like your son every day. And your word is such a huge part of that. May God transform us, change us from the inside out, and fix whatever needs to be changed. We are so in love with you, and we are so thankful for everything, most of all for your Son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The section begins with Paul saying he bows his knees before the Father. Meaning, this is all about prayer to begin with. This is Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. The, the chapter even ends with amen, so you know it's got to be a prayer, right? And if there is a reason for us to have courage, to, to not feel helpless, I think this has got to be pretty high up on that list, don't you think? That we can pray to the Father that Paul describes here, whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. There is not a person that has ever existed who falls through the cracks, who isn't named specifically by the Father. And that's the person, that, that's the being we get to pray to. There's some power in that statement, don't you think? There were a couple of men from Alberta, Canada, who were driving home late one night. The weather was freezing, well below zero. How weather tends to be in Canada, if the movies are any indication. It's always cold in Canada, I'm guessing. Well, unfortunately, these two men ran off the road and they got stuck in a ditch. As far as they could see, there was nobody around for miles and miles. There was nothing. They were in the middle of nowhere Canada. They knew they were in danger of freezing to death. So to keep themselves warm, they pulled the seats out of their Honda and they lit them on fire to stay warm and huddled around the flames. Well, as the flames began to die down, they tossed all their belongings they weren't wearing on fire as well. That only burned for just a little bit of time. Finally, they ended up lighting the entire car on fire. And it worked. They stayed warm throughout the night. But as the sun started to rise, the men saw something incredible. They looked out, and there was a house about 200 yards away. Just right over there, a house. Now, what makes this story so strange is that this happened just a few years ago. Now, you may think, well, why is that weird? Well, over the last several years, what has changed? What what does every single person, I'm guessing, have right now either in their pocket or in their purse? You have a cell phone, don't you? Everybody has a cell phone. These two men had cell phones that night. But they never thought to make a call. And if that doesn't perfectly describe our relationship with prayer, I just don't know what does. But because a lot of times we are exactly like these two men. We have a lifeline of communication. One that is absolutely life-saving. But we fail to use it. We're a lot like that rancher, Mr. Yates, with untold riches at our fingertips. Just never really tapping into it. Why do we not pray, uh, pray more often? Well, why do we not pray more often? I don't know the answer to that question all the time. In fact, I really don't know the answer as to why I don't pray more often, let alone you. 
I can say it's because I'm just too busy. I'm not too busy to watch Netflix on the rare occasion that it's quiet in my house for a change. I'm not too busy to listen to the radio when I'm driving. And I'm not too busy for a lot of things. I'm not too busy to pray. So why don't we pray more? I'm really not sure. When we do pray, why do we not receive or why do we not expect to receive what we ask for? Do you ever have a problem with that? You pray for something, but you really just don't expect it to happen. I think that's common for a lot of us. It's why we pray for a nice sunny day and then we pack an umbrella with us. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about it. Do we think that God isn't listening? Do we think that God isn't capable of answering? Do we just think that God has better things to do than to listen to our silly little prayers? I don't know the answer to those questions, but I do know what Paul tells us here in verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. To him who is able to do far more than what we could ask or think. How much do you think God is capable of? Really think about that question for a second. How much do you think God can do? I hope your answer to that question is something like, well, a whole bunch, obviously. I think God can do a whole bunch. You believe that God can accomplish grand things. I don't think you'd be here if you didn't believe that. Well, according to Paul, God is able to do so much more than that. So much more than you and I could ever even dream of. That it could not even begin to cross our mind what God is actually able to do. You cannot comprehend it. Because God is just that much bigger than you. And really the point Paul's trying to make here is that God is capable of more than you and I could ever even begin to ask for. F.F. F. Bruce, a pretty famous commentator, said one cannot out-ask God. And I really like that statement. You cannot out-ask God. Our prayers that he will lead us through this pandemic, God is capable of that. Our prayers that he will lead us through all the, the divisiveness and the nastiness going on right now, God is capable of that. And here's the big one. Our prayers that the church will survive all of this mess. God is capable of that. And so much more. No matter what request you and I can make of God, He is able to answer. No prayer is too big for Him. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Notice what Jeremiah said about God. He said, Ah, Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Those words are still true today. You realize that, don't you? Do we understand who we're praying to when we make our requests known? Do we understand that he created this universe with his words? That he reached down into the dirt and created man with his own hands? I think he can probably handle the year 2020, don't you? Listen to what God told Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, verses 12 through 15. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayers and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Listen to this. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. So maybe, just maybe, this is where we need to start in 2020, with prayer. We, we are his people, aren't we? We are his people known by his name. J just like this passage says, if we humble ourselves, if we live righteously, you know, turning away from our wicked ways, like it says there, if we will seek his face and if we will pray, he promises us that he will hear from heaven. He will forgive us of our sin and maybe even heal our land. I still believe in that promise. 
Because again, we cannot out-ask God. 1 John 5.14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. That's the confidence we have in God. If we ask, if it's according to His will, He hears. And we cannot out-ask God. That's the confidence we have in our God. But what about the confidence in ourselves? Have you ever doubted your own ability? Maybe these last few, uh, several few months, whatever, have caused you to, to question your own strength. Uh, maybe you've questioned your ability to weather the storm in such a difficult time. I get that. I mean, this year has had a, a, the effect on, uh, uh, on that on us of that, of making us question whether we can make it through all these issues. But the good news is it's not really even about our strength at all. It's about the strength that God supplies. So let's look back at the prayer of Paul off here. We're going to look at the actual content of it. Just verses 14 through 19 here, one more time. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Okay, so there's the prayer, but here's the content of it. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Like I pointed out a couple months ago now, Paul's prayer for them, and this whole section is somewhat of a prayer, but his prayer isn't that they would have good health or that the Ephesian church would find themselves in better circumstances or that God would make things easier for them. That's not his prayer. His prayer is that they would be filled with God. And I mean every aspect of it. Because you see God the Father mentioned here, you see Christ the Son, you see His Spirit, all specifically asked for, that all of God, every ounce of Him, would fill the lives of these Christians. And look at a couple of these qualities of God that are specifically requested for this church in, in Ephesus. Verse 16 again says, that He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. This is something I, I desperately hope that you understand. Look, it has been a scary time, no doubt about that. I hear the worry, the concern, and I understand it. Some of us have been terrified by this pandemic. All right, the thought of, of a virus that we don't know if a person has it or not because you don't know if it's going to cause symptoms or not. You don't know if you're going to catch it, if it's going to make you horribly sick. That's scary, I get it. The social distancing took its toll on many of us being forced to stay in for a while. It's a hard thing. We're not designed for that. We're scared about whether or not things are going to get back to normal. That's scary. The shape of this world has us concerned. All the hatred, the bitterness, the divisions. We wonder if anything can heal the wounds that are in this society. Some of us are nervous about our government, worried that laws might be made in the future that could strip away our, our religious freedoms. It's a scary time for a lot of us, and I get that. <laughs> But you need to remember this, right here, that God grants us to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in our inner being. If there is any group of people who is prepared for the challenges we're facing, if there's any group of people who can be confident, if there's any group of people who can hold their head up high and say, we will endure this, it's us. Because we're the church. We're God's people. We have His Spirit living right here within us. He gives us strength. And He gives us power. I hope that you believe that with all of your heart. Do, do you believe that God can give you that strength, that power, that confidence? Because remember, He is able to do far more than we could ever ask of Him. I know you might be scared. I understand that you might even be discouraged right now. But I pray that you know just what God has given to you. 
And I pray that you'll live like him. With strength, with confidence. You, you may be hurting right now. That you may even feel like you're just hanging on by a thread. But you'll make it through. Because he is with you. The scripture says we've not been given a spirit of fear or weakness. We have been given a, a spirit of power and love. Which brings us to the second aspect of Paul's prayer here. Verses 17 through 9. One more time, I promise. Last time. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The prayer is that this church be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. It is what we just sang about, and we have an anchor. That we be grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. I think one of the worst parts about this world, or this year, has been that it has seemed to bring out the worst in a lot of people. Have you noticed that? It's just brought out the worst in people. How much hatred have we seen this year? How much divisiveness? How many toxic, toxic words have been spewed out of people's mouths? Even out of the mouths of some of us Christians. All of this ugly, ugliness has been far, far more concerning to me than a pandemic. It has me worry that we in the church have joined in with a lot of the arguing, the fighting, and the nasty insults. Those kind of things don't work for us as children of God. It's like I wrote in the, the bulletin article this week. If you haven't read that, you might want to give it a look. You know, even if, if we're right on our stances, if we are using the tools of the world to make our point, hatred, ugliness, nastiness, if that's how we're fighting, if that's how we're standing up to what we believe in, we've already lost. And Satan has already won. So I pray what Paul prayed. That we be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, our Savior. That's how the church survives the nastiness of 2020. We remember the unending love that God has for mankind that was on full display on the cross. And I mean a love that was not just for us, but for everyone. Even for our opponents. We ground ourselves in that love. We dig our feet in and we refuse to be budged from the love of Christ. And we reflect the love God had for us to everybody around us. It's like I said last week, we are the church, and the church loves. It's just what we do. So are you capable of that kind of love, even in 2020 when the world seems to be full of, of so much hatred? I know that's a lot to ask, it seems like. But can God transform us into a group of people that loves without question, without excuse, and without limit. Can God do that? Well, remember that he is able to do far more abundantly than anything we can ask or think. So, how does the church survive 2020? And in fact, come out stronger on the other side? Will we ground ourselves in these things? We ground ourselves in prayer, We've got to become a prayerful people, realizing who it is we're talking to, and he is capable of so much more than we could even dream of. We ground ourselves in the strength of God, realizing that, that we have the powerful spirit living within us, a spirit of power, not of fear and trembling. And we ground ourselves in the love of Christ, realizing that the only answer from the church is love. For too long we have been just like that sheep farmer, sitting on a gold mine of power right under our feet. I think it's just about time for us to drill down and tap into the power of our God. That's how the church survives 2020. Filled with the fullness of God. As we close today, I want to remind you of something that I probably don't say enough, I think. You know, I look around this room and I see many, many great Christian servants. And if a lot of people were to look in this room, they would probably think, well, here's a group of people who have it all together, spiritually. That's not always the case, is it? 
Maybe you do. Maybe you are headed in the right direction and you are looking more like Christ every day. That's great. But that doesn't always happen. I don't know what your spiritual life looks like. I really don't. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. But just kind of playing the odds today, maybe you're not where you need to be. Maybe you have made mistake after mistake. Uh, maybe you have, lately you have been failing God more often than you'd like to admit. Maybe you've made decisions that have led you farther and farther away from your father. Maybe right now you're at a point where you don't know how you got there, you don't know how you can come back. In fact, you don't even know if God would want you back. I don't know if that's you or not, but it might be. I want to remind you today that you could never mess up bad enough to make God stop loving you. You could never fall so far that God could never pick you back up. And you could never go beyond the reaches of God's grace if you'll just come back to Him. You remember the story of the prodigal son? The son who, who had basically lost his mind and squandered everything, but he finally came to his senses. And when he returned to the father, what was the father doing? Did he have his arms crossed, ready to scold his child? No. He was waiting on the horizon with open arms. In fact, he ran to meet his son. God, his arms are wide open for you. If you'll just come to your senses. Maybe you need to do that today. Maybe you need to come running back to God. Or maybe today you need to come to God for the very first time. Whatever you need this morning, I hope you understand that we are here for you as your church and we love you so very much. So please, if you have that need, won't you come forward today as we stand and we sing. Christ will be his aid afford never to fall, never to fall. While I find my precious Lord, sweeter than all, sweeter than all, Jesus is now and never will be, sweeter than all the world to me, since I heard his loving call, sweeter than all, sweeter than all, I can follow all the way, hearing him call, Hearing him call, finding him from day to day, sweeter than all, sweeter than all. Jesus is now and never will be, sweeter than all the world to me, since I heard his loving call, sweeter than all, sweeter than all. When I reach the crystal sea, voices will call, voices will call, but my Savior's voice will be sweeter than all, sweeter than all. Jesus is now and never will be sweeter than all the world to me, since I heard his loving call. Sweeter than all, sweeter than all. It's been great to be together today. I really appreciate the, the treatment of, of this, this text that, that Jay is, is doing. One thing, one thing I would ask you, when that passage says God's able to do more than anything that we ask or imagine, uh, what do you imagine? For our church family, what do you imagine for yourself? Do you have a vision? A vision of where I'd, I'd like to be, and I like to be. I like to improve in these areas. And I, those, I'll tell you what. Those are some things that we can ask ourselves to really. And really, I just need to ask myself, am I, what am I imagining? Uh, or I'm just kind of living reflexively and bouncing off life, and uh, whatever comes comes, and uh, that's all I'm thinking about at the moment. Moment to moment, let me encourage us to, to do that and, and spring out of what uh, what Jay has talked about so nicely today. Great, great job, great job on that. Um, we've sung this song a lot, a lot in the last few years. Uh, 
this has gone well with uh, the logo that we at Slosh Street have. Uh, but you know, the last verse of this song says, Oh, fill me with thy fullness, Lord. It's exactly what Paul is praying in this passage that Jay handled uh, today. So we'll, we'll sing these, these four verses before we have our closing prayer. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living candles of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thy erring children lost and lone. Oh, strengthen me that while I stand firm on the rock and strong in thee, I may stretch out a loving hand to wrestlers with the troubled sea. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious things thou dost impart, and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. Oh, fill me with thy fullness, Lord, until my very heart overflow in kindling thought and glowing word, thy love to tell, thy praise to show. Lord, thank you for another day that you've blessed us with to come to your house and worship you. We ask that um, you watch over our military and missionaries, and we ask that you watch over our leaders and bless them and help them to lead our country in a way that's pleasing to you. We ask that you help us in our decisions and help us to make the right choices. Um, we ask that you let us build up your job, and we ask that you bless the collection, and we ask that uh, you let us all go home safely. We are so thankful for your son, and it's in his name that we pray. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen.